Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Hey, Caroline, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? Really good, really good. Uh, starting the day off bright and early today at 9 a.m. with a podcast recording. So uh, what a great way to start the day. <laughs> I always love it. It you know, gets me in a good mood talking about things and sorting uh, all these thoughts out. And then I can just kind of experience the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah. And uh, today, as as you may have seen from our episode description, we are doing another top five episodes. So this is kind of, this is going to be like a new series for us. Yeah. Very similar to Pop Culture Time Capsule, where we'll, where we'll kind of bring this out every now and then. We did our first one uh, back in, it was like our first show of uh, this year, 2023. And we we're like, oh, what should we do? And we kind of came up with this idea. And we did our top five favorite books and today we're like let's do another one and we're like let's talk about documentaries because this was actually a topic during that last episode on our roundtable questions this was actually your suggestion caroline uh yeah i we've talked about it before we've had documentaries as a i don't want to say backup idea because it's a front line idea for a for a show but it's always been one that we've known we could do if we um had to or if a if there was an issue with a guest and we had to change um direction quickly uh because you and i are both big fans of documentaries yeah yeah big time you know when i on the weekend <laughs> you know i'll look i'll look and see like oh you know the weekend is where i do the majority of my movie watching and it seems like and maybe this is just me getting older i don't know but it seems like the majority of my movies now on the weekend i'm like ooh, there's a new true crime documentary or ooh, there's this other documentary i want to watch so documentaries like if you'd asked me as a teenager i had zero interest in them but now Bring on the documentaries. There's so much to discuss. And there's so many different topics out there in the world. I mean, you can have a documentary about literally anything. And I was thinking through like my own watching history. I've watched documentaries about tiny houses, uh, wedding photography, type font. And that was a good one. Uh, Donkey Kong the AIDS epidemic, the history of casting directors. And those were just the ones that I could think of off the top of my head. Wow. Yeah, it's funny because I was going through um, a website called Flick Chart, and I mentioned this before. Every time I watch a movie, I'll just kind of add it in there, and it ranks movies I've watched. And I went into, like, the documentaries category. And for me, it was, like, definitely a lot of – I don't – my topics all were kind of similar in a way. Like I've got a lot of sports documentaries in there, yeah. which is funny because uh, today I really, do I have a sports documentary pick? I don't think I do. Maybe one is questionable to be one, but. Uh, if you want to hear us talk about sports documentaries, go back and listen to our sports movie episode because we touch on the 30 for 30 series yes. right there. Yeah. Yes. So I do not have a 30 for 30 pick There's some on today's good ones. episode. Yeah, but go check out that uh, sports movies uh, episode for sure. So uh, yeah, this is just going to be Caroline and myself today. And uh, just like our previous top five episode, we're going to be alternating picks and uh, sharing our own personal uh, favorite documentaries. But before we do, let's do our overdue finds picks. Caroline, uh, what have you been enjoying lately? Uh, I recently did a binge of the Scream movies, uh, and I know that this is kind of out, well, I don't know if it's out of season for horror movies, uh, and I, and I, it was related to Scream 6, or Scream, what are, are they calling it? They're not calling it Scream 6. It's Scream... Yeah, it's, it, it like... Yeah, on the poster, they've got, yeah. like, the Roman numerals with okay. the Scream. So it is technically Scream 6. Okay. Well, I haven't seen that one yet. That one was just released. But, um, yeah, the uh, up to Scream 5, or alt which is also just Scream, 
it, it's it's hard to explain, but um, that movie does some really interesting things. It's still the meta um, uh, horror sh- movie that um, really set the first Scream from the 90s uh, apart. But the way that they're doing it and the um, the commentary on it is all new and it kind of reflects where horror is now. And there are discussions in there about, um, you know, the difference between maybe slashers and uh, higher brow horror. Um, The A24 Yes. (laughs) Yeah. You know, like, can you imagine, uh, I guess, spoilers for original Scream, but can you imagine Drew Barrymore in that first scene when it's asked, like, what's your favorite scary movie? And like she says, the Babadook. Now, put aside that that movie (laughs) did not exist when that movie came out. But, you know, that's the that's the answer given when that question is posed now and it's just a really different thing i mean phones are so different like this is when you watch the all five kind of back to back which is what i did all of a sudden i didn't kind of go into it with a plan to watch all of them but um if you watch scream then you have to watch scream 2 and then you're all the way like parker posey then is in scream 3 so you're you're practically done already by the time you look up and it's like oh i'm watching scream 4 um but seeing the technology change over time as well and the difference between like you know people don't answer the phone as much anymore so there have to be reasons why they are um uh being told or compelled to answer the phone or uh scream 4 has a whole kind of plot line ish about how live streaming is the way to go and uh you know that's being new and novel and everything so um yeah i think i'm interested to see where scream 6 takes things um uh if you haven't seen them in a while uh look for them uh but you also could kind of jump back in at scream five if you really just wanted to yeah that's totally true i have not seen scream six either i think mostly because i wasn't a big fan of scream five I think I guessed who the killer was like right away and it just kind of ruined the rest of the movie for me. <laughs> they they tell you who the movie is, who the killer is yeah. right away. Like it's like one of these like when when you're done you're like wait, did they literally just tell us who to be suspicious of? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. But uh I remember seeing I was in uh the 12th grade when the first Scream movie came out and I remember at the time um like it was obviously like now it's like oh this huge huge series obviously when the first movie came out it was just this small horror movie people didn't really know much about it drew barrymore was listed as the star yep. and i remember going to see it with friends and we were just blown away because it was just very like very meta yeah. and it was just smart like it was just different than anything else that was coming out at the time and now we've had like a lot of kind of scream clones where they try and be really clever with the dialogue and you know and referencing other movies and everything but uh yeah like like you said if it's been a while go back and watch the at least the first scream anyway uh i recently uh caroline i recently watched scream three again and that is the most early 2000 movie yeah. I think I've ever seen before. Yeah. <laughs> Just everything about it, the music, the clothes, uh, yes. Courtney Cox's bangs. Like oh, it's just the screams. <laughs> early 2000s. Yeah, a Scream 3 is one where, so I don't, I, I maybe it's because I've seen, I, I, I do tend to watch them all together, but I don't always remember who the killer is when I rewatch them. Um, especially because um, in Scream Two, Three, and even Four, uh, they there are a lot of suspects. Like they try to make you think it's a lot of people. I was so convinced I remembered who 
the killer or one of the killers was in Scream 3 to the point where when it got to the end of the movie and it wasn't him, I was like, <laughs> wait, what? So, but it was still satisfying. Yeah, it's it's still entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's my recommendation uh, for this week. Bryce, how about you? Yeah, so I actually have a uh, music pick Ooh. this week. Um, I think I've actually casually mentioned this band before, but uh, lately, just in my you know in my drive to and from work. I've got kind of uh, through Sirius uh, Satellite Radio. I've been listening to this like new wave uh, station, which has actually been really good. So obviously it's got this kind of alternative uh, pop music from the 80s. And one of the bands that I kind of rediscovered uh, through listening to a lot of this new wave music is The Cars. And they are my overdue finds pick this week. Um, Yeah, they're just... It's funny because when you think of the cars and some of their some of their hits, like you're like, oh yeah, these guys are pretty good. So I've gone, I've been able to go back now, and listen to uh, some of their older albums and kind of like their greatest hits collections, and I absolutely love their music. So if you're not that familiar with the cars, uh, they have this great rock kind of synth sound and uh, they did a really great job of kind of combining uh, classic rock with these new wave sounds of the early 80s Um, they really kind of uh, hit the mainstream though in 1978 Uh, rolling stone magazine that year actually named them named them the best new band of the year as far as their big hits go that everybody will recognize its songs like shake it up just what I needed, and let's go. Um, sadly, their lead singer, uh, Rick Okasek, uh, passed away in 2019. So uh, we unfortunately don't get any new music from them anymore, but you can borrow their CDs or stream their music uh, from us through Hoopla. And uh, if you just kind of want to go back and get a refresher on them, uh, I recommend actually going with the Best of the Cars album to uh relive some of their best music and uh i've talked about this on the show before it was kind of a little bit of a running joke for a little bit i love good music that you can drive to the cars obviously in their name anyway the cars is perfect driving music (laughs) but yeah check out the cars if it's been a while Uh, you will love their music all right so let's get into it uh caroline today we were talking about our favorite documentaries and just like the past one so what we're going to be doing today is uh we each have our five favorite documentaries listed here um i don't know what caroline's picked you don't know what i've picked no uh this is going to be really fun but just out of curiosity uh caroline um i guess maybe how do you have your uh list organized today My list this time, so last time uh, when we talked about uh, top five books, I uh, went with chronological biographical uh, order. (laughs) Uh, This time I... Very librarian of you. Yes, thank you. Um, This time I went with loose ranked. You know, I would say that they, they are somewhere in the top five any given day any given mood um and also there's a there was a little bit of not crafting it for me but as i was going i realized that many of mine were on a similar theme so then i kept going with it and that meant that um maybe some of the other ones that if i if i you know really thought about it then maybe you know, Helvetica, which was the type font documentary that um, is available on Canopy, and I do recommend people check out, that could have snuck its way into um, my top five, but I decided to to really just stick with the, the movies that were on my overall theme. Yeah. How about you? Last time you went straight up top ranked. 
Yeah, this one is, I kind of went the same theme for this one, but it's funny, uh, Caroline, I know you were busy this morning, so we had to delay our recording by about 10 minutes. And in that 10 minutes, I was like, I shifted my list completely. Whoa. Because like, I woke up this morning and I was like, oh, I should have included this film. So I scratched one, added another, you know, my number three last night is now my number one today. Um, just kind of going by gut feel and this is, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, mine is loosely roughly based on like, this is what I consider to be the, the best documentary of all time, according to me. Yeah. But who knows next week I'll be, you know, when I hear this episode back after, after we're done editing it, I'll be like, no, you should have included this one instead. Yeah. I mean, I, I always, I think that on a good week, you know, when we're just talking about, you know, regular stuff, let alone ranking things. Um, and then there were a couple that I haven't seen in a while, or I think I might be in a different place with, um, I've been intending to rewatch, uh, Paris is burning, uh, which is a documentary. I hope, I hope I'm not scooping yours. I'm trying not to, nope. uh, nope, take nope. out, I but, um, Paris is burning is a documentary about the New York drag scene in the eighties. And it's where we get a lot of, things that have become more mainstream through a show like RuPaul's Drag Race um, from the ballroom scene in uh, drag culture. And when I first watched Paris is Burning, I don't, I don't think I had the context for understanding it or really appreciating it. Um, I thought it was going to be a lot like funnier in, in ways. And I just think that I'm at a different place now um, and I think my experience of watching it now might be different, um, but I did, haven't had a chance to rewatch it yet. So, you know, if we did this episode again in a year, um, my perspective on things might be a little different. Yeah, for sure. Um, that was kind of like me too when I was going through my list and, you know, kind of going through flick chart and I had some documentaries ranked like super high. And then I was like, but I'd watched them so long ago. Um, like I had some like Michael, Michael Moore documentaries on yeah. there. And I was like, I don't, I don't know if I feel the same way about this movie as I, as I once did. So I kind of like left them out and I'll like the movie in particular that I'm thinking of is Bowling for Columbine. Yeah. Uh, so I don't apologies if you have that on your list, but no. um, yeah, that was one where it's like, I think ranked second for me. And I was like, I don't know if I, I felt comfortable talking not so much the subject matter but i was like i i need to really watch this again i think to yeah. do it justice in order to really talk about it so that's why i didn't in, that's why i didn't include it but um and i know it's obviously a very important documentary and it's kind of sad too that you know 25 years after this tragedy happened we're still having those discussions so uh yeah i, I need to go watch that one again all right so let's get started caroline uh what's uh what's your first uh pick the first one, um, I am going to mention one that we actually don't have in our collection, but it is available to, to uh, stream on the NFB website, um, and the library does offer computer access. So if you want to stream it on the NFB site, um, you can come to the library and do that. And that's the documentary birth of a family and it's directed by tasha hubbard and epl has actually um had screenings of this in the past it's a recent documentary about four siblings who all share the same mother and they were removed from uh her care at different points in their lives um really though through the the 60s scoop era of Canadian history. And the documentary is about the four siblings. There's three, um, three sisters and a brother re meeting each other as adults and getting to know each other and finding each other and trying to piece together who their mother was and what was taken from them and, and what they missed out on as an experience. And it has them kind of going on this family 
trip to the mountains together and they're all just processing it in in different ways there's like the person who's so happy and cheerful and almost in denial about certain elements there's you know there's anger there's um uh regret there's wanting to move on there's not knowing how to move on it's it's just a really personal story that um is captured with such empathy for the family and the 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 mother and you know it really puts a face on that era of canadian history yeah that's definitely like i've i haven't heard i haven't uh, seen that movie uh it sound, sounds really good and very very powerful um i think that's kind of it kind of sounds like those are those are really when documentaries are kind of like the best when you can take this you know you know we've all heard now about the 60s scoop and all these terrible things that that had happened and you know it is that's really the power of documentaries is it you know being able to tell these tell these real life stories and um let let people who wouldn't necessarily or normally have a platform be able to share their experiences with others and hopefully it resonates with i i know for a fact it would obviously resonate with with other uh, canadians and people across the world so uh, yeah that's that sounds like that sounds really good yeah and and just kind of you know it has the be- the beats of you know uh finding out or meeting your sibling uh at uh a point where you're adults and looking back and being like oh we have the same mannerisms or oh we both this this is what our nose looks like and finding those things and um just the way that they're processing in such different ways but also similar ways and kind of bringing home the 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 personal effect and then thinking of it magnified across an entire generation it's just really interesting so that's uh birth of a family and it can be streamed on the national film board uh website and you can come to the library and and have computer access to stream it my first movie my number five one seems like we'd kind of be doing a disservice to the topic of documentaries if we don't include at least one film or series from documentary master Ken Burns. And, Thank you, uh, because I felt the same thing and knew <laughs> that I would not have one. So thank you. <laughs> this is the one that I added kind of last minute today. And I was like, we have to have a Ken Burns documentary on it. We can't be like, these are the top five documentaries and not have any Ken Burns representation. Um, So my Ken Burns film that I'm a documentary series, actually, it's a series. We got 10 episodes here. Uh, It's called The Vietnam War. Uh, I've actually talked about this uh, series on the show before. Um, So, yeah, basically, uh, like all Ken Burns documentaries, whether it's about baseball or jazz, he does a fantastic job of doing a deep dive into specific topics. So this one, of course, is on the Vietnam War, which uh, ran for 20 years. Not as many people. I don't think a lot of people realize how long it actually went on for but it ran from uh, 1955 to 1975 so in this documentary really we get like how we kind of started uh in the in the early 50s to obviously america's involvement and we hear from uh, people who fought for uh, kind of obviously for the Viet Cong and then america and uh leaders and all this other stuff so Uh, You really get to hear some uh, incredibly powerful stories from the men and women who served, along with families of those uh, men who did serve but weren't able to come back and share their story. It goes into, like, really why this was such a a complex war. And I think, you know, when you go back and you look at footage kind of from around that time, you see a lot of uh, protesting going on and people were really opposed to it. But what's really interesting about this documentary is... You know, when you talk about like really when most Americans really became aware of it in kind of like the late 60s, you have a lot of these 
uh, younger American males, like kids coming right out of high school. They were like 17, 18 years old, and they felt kind of the need to serve um, their country because their fathers served in maybe it was Korea or World War II, and it was just something that American men did. They they go off to war. So, um, yeah, there's lots of tragic stories in there about, you know, these these kids who go off to war thinking they're doing this great service for their country and they are, but you know, then also too, we get, you know, these letters sent home saying, you know, I've made a big mistake and I don't know why we're here and all this other stuff. So obviously a very, very complex uh, topic, but uh, yeah, Vietnam war by Ken Burns. Uh, We have it in our collection. You can stream it, uh, through Hoopla, or uh, we also have it on DVD as well. So since it's ten hours, it's it's a good one to borrow and kind of slowly street or slowly watch over maybe a week or two. But um, yeah, great great documentary, and I'm actually watching now a new Ken Burns one that just came out earlier this year called The U.S. and the Holocaust. I'm not done it yet, but uh, I have a feeling it's one that I'll be talking about on the show um, a little bit later on. Now, I I don't know that I've actually watched a Ken Burns documentary. Would the Vietnam War one be a good entry point for me or should I should I warm up to his style? Uh, you know what? That's actually a pretty good one to get into, I think. I haven't seen kind of the the jazz one or the one on the civil war was kind of his most famous one that really put Ken Burns on the map. Uh, I've watched baseball as somebody who loves baseball. It's kind of some of those earlier (laughs) episode, the first episodes really getting into the history of it does tend to get a little dry. Uh, This one I think is a, this one I found to be his most interesting one myself anyway. Um, But uh, that's actually, I think that would be a good one to kind of, uh, dip your toe into the water on and uh, see whether or not you like it. It, it. And I mean, obviously, you know, we're talking about a war that ended like over 50 years ago or whatever, or however long it, ago it was. Uh, but, you know, it's still kind of um, the topic of going to war is relevant. And we hear from people who served there and it's, it's an interesting documentary. Um, next on my list, I uh, have a, a movie that, kind of encapsulates one of the genres of documentary that I really like, which is why am I watching a movie about this person? And there are people that I've never heard of, um, more or less just ordinary, everyday people, but someone has crafted a documentary sometimes it's themselves which is uh i then i'm like oh well i know why i'm watching this um and sometimes it's because they have an an incident or episode in their life that is just you know needs to be told and um this next documentary on my list is uh dear zachary Uh, And I know that this is one that you've seen, Bryce. It's um, a, the story of uh, a guy who was a a doctor. He went to medical school. Uh, He was loved. He was a friend, son, uh, classmate, just everyone really loved him. And uh, then one day he was murdered. And as the friend uh, slash director uh, of the movie tells us he decided he wanted to find out everything he could. He realized that he was never going to have another conversation with Andrew, um, but he could interview the people who knew Andrew and find out all of the details or as much about his life as he could, because, you know, there's this interesting piece around it where, um, I think he he goes he talks to a, um, a colleague of Andrews at the funeral and is like yeah you know he was he was so great at photography and the 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 friend is like wait what I never knew that and so it's this kind of like being able to make a composite of someone out of 
all of their different angles and how people know them. That's the original intention for the movie. As it goes on, it turns into something much different. Um, The person who... I don't know, do I say allegedly murdered Andrew, um, becomes a much bigger uh, plot in the story. Um, It's just this harrowing account of, I don't know, I I don't want to give it away for people to watch it. Um, I do want to say it is one of the saddest, most difficult watches I've had watching a documentary. Yeah, it's been a quite a while since I've I've seen it, and uh, yeah, I did not have that on my list. But uh, yes, I would. Um, yeah, I remember that uh, documentary, and yeah, it's uh, very very sad and just such such a tragic such a tragic story that I mean, you know, we love you know, uh, reading about different stories and real life events. And, uh, this, that's also one like Dear Zachary is also a perfect example of once again, why documentaries are, can be almost kind of like the best medium for some of these, for some of these stories, because, you know, instead of, you know, we're reading, um, maybe quotes, we're actually seeing these family members and they're like talking about, you know, their son or their, you know, friend or brother or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's very, very powerful movie. My next pick, I said at the beginning that I didn't have a sports pick. Actually, I think this is kind of a sports pick. So, uh, Caroline, when you think of some of the greatest rivalries in sports, yeah, you think of maybe the Yankees, Red Sox, Celtics, Lakers, yeah. Blames Oilers naturally. Of course. But one that isn't in the conversation that maybe should be is the rivalry between middle school teacher Steve Weeby and hot sauce maker slash ladies man Billy Mitchell, who are fighting it out to hold the world record for the high score in the classic arcade game donkey kong so of course my number four pick is the king of kong a fistful of quarters uh this has been a overdue finds pick of mine i think last year maybe the year before uh absolutely love this documentary everything about it is is great um as somebody who loves kind of playing old classic video games like i remember uh first hearing about this documentary shortly after it came out in 2007 and i was like Like, I need to see this movie. Like, that was, like, my tentpole movie. And, of course, this was pre-days of Netflix and streaming and everything. So I had to, like, wait for it to have this long theatrical run and then finally come out on DVD after, like, a year or something like that. And, of course, the movie or the documentary did not disappoint me at all all um so yeah basically the rivalry is at the forefront in this documentary between uh weeby and mitchell um basically as they kind of go across the country more so uh, steve weeby and kind of competing in these classic retro arcade game tournaments and uh we see steve set up in his garage with his donkey kong arcade cabinet and trying to kind of beat this world record um this is actually one of the rare documentaries um, Uh, that really keeps you on the edge of your seat as you watch it. And you're rooting for Steve Wiebe to defeat Billy Mitchell. Um, There's another documentary, too, I would kind of put in the same category of, is this a sport? But it kind of keeps you on the edge. And I won't mention it just in case it's one of your picks, but I'll maybe mention it towards the end if it isn't. I definitely do not have whatever movie you're you're about to say. And you couldn't Uh, say that about any of the others I have on my list. Okay, okay. So... The one I kind of compared it to and I almost made my list was Spellbound, uh, which came out, I believe, 2001. And it's about the uh, Scripps National Spelling Bee. And you have all these kids kind of competing and you kind of have like maybe one or two kids that you're kind of rooting for to win. And But just like that documentary, it kind of keeps you on the edge of your seat and you're kind of wondering what's going to happen. Is he going to get the world record or is he going to be cheated out of this from Billy Mitchell, who's very very suspect at times so it's just a fun documentary and uh really love it 
Yeah. So, uh, around that time as well, there was um, Word Wars, which was about competitive Scrabble players. So I also, I think um, I, I documentary that shows people who are passionate about something um, is, is a really compelling subject documentary area for me. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. What do you have next on your list, Caroline? Uh, Next on my list, uh, one I talked about as recently as last week, um, Stories We Tell by Sarah Pauly. Uh, This is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, It's uh, the story of Sarah Pauly, who is a Canadian actress. We talked about her. She was in Road to Avonlea. Um, She uh, was in the movie Go, The Sweet Hereafter. Um, Also, the Ramona TV adaptation that uh, needs, that should get more love than it does. Um, But that's another podcast um and and so it's sarah Polly telling the story of her life um but kind of through the story of her mother who um was originally married had uh two kids with her first husband they divorced. She lost custody of them in one of like a landmark case where one of the first um, uh, per, uh, male parental figures to gain custody of uh, children. Uh, and then she remarried to Michael Polly, had two more kids, um, did various things. She was an actress. She was a uh, casting director. She was in the theater. Um, and then uh later in life uh, had Sarah and there were always jokes growing up about Sarah not resembling um, Michael or uh, not knowing who Sarah's real father was and um, then at some point in her life Sarah comes to realize that um, they're not so much jokes as true and uh the man that she thought was her father and considered her father michael Polly, was not her biological father and then so she goes and like sets out to find who it might be based on and um who her her mother may have uh been around at that time sarah's mother had died when she was uh young when she was uh not even a teenager and um having the memory of someone um again this idea of can you how well can you know someone if you know them in one way and um it it matches together that kind of mapping of who a person is with memory and narrative and how we create stories and um she when she's interviewing because she interviews her whole family her four uh brothers and sisters are um uh part of the documentary her father michael is is part of the documentary um the the biological father when she finds him he's part of this and you know there are these moments where like one brother will say oh no he started this and then the other brother will be like actually he started this and then you know what is truth really um and how does that does it get changed over time there's just so much happening in this documentary and just sarah's willingness to explore these things and put them out there and um engage with it and then the way that it just plays with the format of of um footage and recreation and crafting like even the 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 footage in the movie it's just so well done um this was one of her for it uh she had directed um a few other things by this point but this was one that i just keep coming back to because you can you can tell who she is as an artist through this documentary. Yeah. I am definitely going to be checking that out. Sounds really good. Good. What's next on your list? 
you know, my next pick is a documentary whose tagline was a little kindness makes a world of difference. And uh, my pick is the 2018 documentary. Won't you be my neighbor? So uh, this documentary uh, takes a look back at the life of famed children's television host Fred Rogers. Um, Of course, we all know him as Mr. Rogers. Uh, We get to hear from the people who had the opportunity to work with him on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and his wife, too, who, uh, you know, kind of shares what he was like in person and, you know, the great sense of humor that he had. And then we also kind of find out too, it's like, oh, maybe, you know, the Fred Rogers we saw on TV really wasn't that far off from, you know, what he was like in real life. Um, you know, just kind of the important role that, you know, he had in a lot of kids, um, not only like our age, but, you know, uh, you know, our, you know, our parents or whoever else or kids kind of just coming up today had such a huge role in uh in kind of us growing up and was there to kind of go over difficult uh real life topics like stuff like the assassination of robert kennedy in in the uh in the late 60s early 70s talked about the war in vietnam uh race relations there's a very famous clip of him and uh the mailman character from the show who is black and showed them like, you know, it was a hot day and them, you know, putting their feet in water to cool down and how that was, that was okay to do. We're all, you know, we're all people and let's be nice to each other. Um, he would go over stuff too, like the challenger explosion, divorce and the end of uh nine and sorry, and nine uh, 11. So, um, and probably most importantly, the, the documentary kind of also goes into his role with uh, the public uh, public television and how U.S. Congress in, I think it was the 70s, was going to cut like all funding to it. It was pointless. Nobody watches this. And he went before Congress and explained like why public access television is so important to so many people, especially those who... Um, you know, can't afford cable and this is their only outlet and why this type of programming is, is so important to uh, children's development and everything. So, um, yeah, basically. And also, too, I saw this I saw this documentary in the theater and at the end of the documentary. Uh, so they asked these people in the, at the in the film, you know, what would the world be like if there was more Fred Rogers? And really, of course, we could always use more Fred Rogers, but I I remember leaving the theater with Cheryl on this one and just like all these people with like red eyes, just like bawling at the end. So uh great documentary on the life of uh, Mr. Rogers. That was a really good one. I would recommend watching that in maybe a double feature with street gang, the Sesame street one. Yeah. I also I almost included that on my list, but I didn't because Caroline, I thought you might have that on yours. I I don't, but I oh, okay. recommend people. I mean, this was tough. This was it was really really hard to get it to five. So, uh, what's your number uh, four movie? My number four or number two, depending on which way we're we're counting on this, is. Um, Three Identical Strangers, which I think I've talked about on the podcast uh, briefly before, and it's a documentary. Um, I guess I can reveal at this point that my overall kind of theme is family, uh, because that's what uh, I was really drawn to when I started um, uh, putting these together. But Three Identical Strangers is the story of three men who when they were around 18, 19, 20, found each other and realized they were triplets. Um, They had been separated at birth, adopted out to different families. Um, One of them was at, when they went away to college, um, he was stopped by someone on the street and they were like, you look just like my friend. Uh, You have to meet him. So they met and it's like, yeah, you look just like me this is so wild and then they found out later on that there was a third triplet brother 
Um, and they go through and it's, it's just these wild coincidences about, you know, the families they grew up in and their histories and, um, different, uh, things that were similar, um, around their, their behaviors and mannerisms. And they kind of became like famous out of this they went on you know uh the phil uh donahue show or uh uh they were they appeared in uh as a like a sight gag in a madonna movie uh they were like people knew these these triplets these brothers um but it was a lot to handle and um they couldn't all really deal with that then as they keep pulling at the story of their birth and their adoptions, um, they realize that maybe everything wasn't a coincidence. And the fact that they all grew up in similar families wasn't just something that happened, but was something that was orchestrated. And then the Nazi scientists show up. Wow! <laughs> Sorry. No, because that is like my favorite, like point where you're going along, and it's been this, like, like, oh wow, this is wild. Because you do that, right? Like, you hear like there was um one child and another child, and it's like, wow, we both grew up. We were um, I think they had, they all had a sister. It must have been an older sister um, because they knew the, who the family was at the time. So, um, you know, you, when they find each other, they go through and it's like, oh, wow, you grew up in a family and you had an older sister and I had an older sister. And uh, there are all these similarities. Um, but then you realize this is not random. This is not um, this was done intentionally. Uh by these scientists who uh, may have had Nazi ties uh, because they wanted to study uh, genetics. And so they um, took the children and they real they you come to realize that they weren't actually triplets, but there was another brother and um, they were put into families that were similar, but then had different differences um and so like the economic social um uh background of the families was was different and they were using some elements as controls and some were the variables and um the the uh, genetic background and the history of the the mother it was kept secret from them and um there was this refusal to share the information it just becomes this like wild thing and you really do when you're watching it feel like you have the rug pulled out from under you and you're off balance um on this i think you know not all of the three brothers had a happy um end to their story and that was one of the the things for me i i know i feel like i'm giving too much away here but when i was watching it um you know because they're identical and they don't have, um, they don't always have like name captions under them. So I, you you <laughs> see different clips, and you you assume you're seeing three brothers, and yeah. then they're like, oh, no, you've only been seeing two this whole time because um, the third one is not with us. So uh, yeah, it's just this wild story that. Like when you try to explain it, it just sounds so wild, but really happened. Where can I watch this? Because that's my next watch. Absolutely. Where would you believe me if I said Hoopla? <laughs> Thanks, Hoopla. <laughs> yeah, because that's that's the truth. It is available okay. uh, through EPL on Hoopla. Okay, what's next on your list? All right, so number two on my list is this is definitely a movie I've talked about before on the show, but uh, I couldn't get it out of my mind, and it's just such a fantastic idea for a documentary, and it's just 
just so awesome. Uh, mine is the 2018 uh, documentary uh, called They Shall Not Grow Old. So this is the one uh, from Peter Jackson, of course, who most people know is director of the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy and the, and the Hobbit uh, trilogy as well. More so, let's focus on Lord of the Rings here. But in this film, uh, Peter Jackson kind of uses uh, this state-of-the-art technology and old footage from the BBC and all these other archives to tell the story of World War I from the men who were actually there. So they take these old, this old like black and white footage from the war. Of course, there's like no sound or anything, and it's all super grainy and everything. So they're able to like clean up this footage um kind of like figure out uh based on kind of what they're kind of look at the soldiers mouths and they can see like figure out roughly what they're saying um and also too you know for a documentary about world war one most people of course like you would just see these still photos or maybe drawings of course because obviously it's world war one and technology wasn't there yet uh but we really get to kind of see what life on the front line what life on the front lines was like for these soldiers during uh the first world war we get to experience it through the voices of the soldier and they discuss their feelings about the conflict and we see what kind of food they ate and you know them like joking around with each other um and yeah, it's just, you know, I've said this already, but it's just, it's such a well done documentary and it really brings back to life and honors, you know, those brave men who fought in World War One. And it's, you know, uh, obviously we do not have any World War One veterans still, but, you know, we do kind of get to see through this documentary anyway, um, what life was what life was like and kind of putting a more human face to the war, which we obviously don't get uh, just because it took place so long ago. And the movie really uh, Peter Jackson kind of um, this movie is kind of in dedication to his uh, grandfather who had served in uh, the first world war. So uh, yeah, it's funny because Caroline, I could have, just put like a ton of war documentaries on on my list i think that's the sign also of me getting old is like ooh, a, a new world war documentary count me <laughs> in but uh this is also one too where if you're not you know like for example uh the vietnam war one that i talked about earlier definitely some you know graphic stuff that's that's discussed and everything um this one is definitely a lot more um I don't want to say more, like more positive, but it's just, I don't know. It's a lighter watch than, than the Ken Burns one is anyway. And uh, it is really cool to see, you know, more so kind of behind the scene, or more so like what it was like for the soldiers kind of when they weren't in the field and they were joking around with each other. And these were at the time, like, you know, boys really like these 16, 17, 18 year olds who were going off to war, just terrible stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's it's really really interesting film. Yeah, have you seen the movie um, Dawson City: Frozen Time? No, it's a documentary from uh, I think it was released twenty sixteen, uh, and it's about these these film prints from the early nineteen hundreds that were found in. Dawson City and how they took them and uh, I think it's 533 nitrate film prints uh, that had been lost or and or people didn't know about them and then when they were uncovered um, they were able to restore them and put them together and now they have this look at like early 1900s um, Dawson City North um exploration and like this just that period of time and i think there's i it's it's a documentary it's all it's on my list to watch and i just haven't um that one you can watch through canopy uh okay. if you're interested in uh checking it out uh but it's it's one that's been on my list to check out this idea of like uncovering history from people who were there yeah definitely yeah once again that's one of the cool things about documentaries is we can do that and i mean 
books to also tell a great story, but it, you know, when you can actually see it yourself and actually kind of get that feeling of what it was like, then it uh, definitely uh, connects with you a little bit more. Yeah. So Caroline, yes. number one, what is your number one pick here? My number one pick uh, kind of straddles that area between movie and series. Uh, I've talked about it several times on the show that is the staircase uh the original documentary series um about uh michael peterson who found his wife at the bottom of the stairs in their house um called 911 she uh was dead and this legal battle unfolded um as the police uh charged michael peterson with the murder of his wife kathleen he maintained his innocence uh the french film crew uh had been wanting to find a subject to talk about um uh the Amer the american judicial system and how it plays out and originally in the the story they had access to both the prosecution and defense sides of things as the trial goes on the prosecution limits their access so the story tends to focus more on michael and the defense um and so you get to see uh both the story at the heart of it, which is the relationship between um, Michael and Kathleen and her death, but then also how they come up with and deal with um, her, the, the elements of the trial uh, and crafting and mounting a defense for Michael. Um, and it follows and like the filmmakers, they're really embedded in this, this family that is going through this um this experience in front of these cameras uh i've talked about it it was made into uh an hbo series a fictionalized version of the documentary uh just uh last year and um just really interesting since then uh coming out and hearing michael's family talk about their experience with the documentary where they feel um that perhaps i don't I don't know if they've gone in as far as like taken advantage of, but you know, what are you consenting to when you agree to um, have someone tell your story and how long do they tell your story and who owns your story and all these kind of questions that spin off uh, around this idea of once it's, once something is out there, how do you deal with that? And um yeah, just a lot of really interesting um, questions have come out of it. The documentary itself, I mean, some parts of it, it's quite long. I think um, it has eight episodes and they're all about an hour each. Um, and again, like some of them are, are fairly dry in terms of going over like legal defense. Some of them are way more interesting in terms of the the revelations that come up but um just overall a really really fascinating story and this documentary that captures so many of the questions around it yeah i would definitely agree with that pick and it's funny because i when i was uh kind of making my list i was like i i think caroline's gonna have this one yeah. on her so uh good guess um yeah it, it's really interesting because you know um, is somebody who I don't want to say I enjoy true crime, but I, you know, I am fascinated kind of by books and documentaries on it. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about a lot of true crime is, you know, we get this, you know, we hear from prosecutors or the police or whoever, whoever is like investigating this terrible crime that took place and kind of the hunt for the hunt for justice. But yeah, this is, this is one where it's like it, gives you a really good look into kind of the whole like I don't want to say like legal system but just the the idea of like somebody going to trial and how long it is and just yeah. this grueling marathon with the lawyers and gets into stuff about like money and how expensive this is to like hire lawyers and experts and uh it's just 
it's fascinating. And this is one too. And I mentioned this, I think when you were talked, when you last talked about this documentary was that I don't think I've ever like flip flopped as much <laughs> as like, Oh, this guy's so guilty. And then like you watch the next episode and you're like, well, no, maybe that's actually, they make a pretty good point here. Maybe he didn't do this. So yeah, you just, yeah. I totally flip flopped on this one. It, it is, it's a fascinating documentary. Yeah. And I think, um, so the, mur- the, the death of Kathleen uh, happened in December of 2001. So then the trial over the next couple of years, initially after that, and uh, part of the story or the, the, what unfolds is that um, Michael Peterson had relationships, sexual relationships with men and like just watching people react to that news um and how like i people just seem like blown away by the concept of like bisexuality and it's like if you if if things were different now it's it's kind of the same as uh or similar to when i look um at the uh O.J. Simpson trial from the 90s and think about, you know, the public's understanding of forensics and DNA. um, And it was just at such a different place. And think, you know, if if people's understanding was in a different place, would, would the reaction or would the understanding of it be different? And I mean, I guess you can't pick and choose which elements of time you're going to play with around something like that. But it's just very interesting to watch, um, you know, people trying to wrap their heads around someone who had been with a man and a woman. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that part and it's just like, yeah, I mean, that was 22 years ago and it's just like, Oh my God. But you know, today I definitely don't think it would be as scandalous as it, as it was in, in that documentary. Um, before I get to my pick, though, that remind me of an honorable mention I have. And that's OJ Made in America. Yeah. Which is a 30 for 31. We did mention that already in our, our sports movies one. But I would kind of put that up with the, the staircase where, you know, if you're looking for something a little bit more longer than just maybe an hour and a half or two hour long documentary. And uh, just like the staircase, it's, you know, several episodes and um, OJ made in America is another really, really good one. While we're, we're talking about that, I'm going to bounce off your honorable mention to mention um, the, another 30 for 30. I I promise we're not sponsored um, (laughs) by uh, the, the documentary June 17th, 1994, which is very different from any um, other documentary we've mentioned today. It's kind of a narrative list um, account of all of the sports news stories that were happening on June 17th, 1994. Um, I know there was one in the golf world. It was the NBA finals. And then over the course of the movie it gets taken over by OJ Simpson and the Ford Bronco chase. Um, so uh, check it out. It's, 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 definitely an example of pushing at uh the the boundaries of documentary and how it can be um maybe an art form as well as um a narrative tool uh so my number one pick here caroline this is what i've never mentioned on the show before can't wait um I've had, I noticed on my list, I'm like, got some pop culture picks. You got some Mr. Rogers in there. Uh, I got some war picks, obviously Vietnam War and they shall, shall not grow old. So why not combine them into my last pick? So this is like my number one documentary. And that is Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse. Uh, Caroline, have you, have you seen this one? I have not, but if I had thought about it, I should have come up with this one for you. Yeah. 
So if you're not familiar with uh, with this documentary, it came out actually in uh, 1991 and uh, basically kind of paint a little bit of a picture for you about this documentary. In the late 70s, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, famous director, was coming off of winning Academy Awards and acclaim uh, from directing uh, two Godfather films. So he decided that his next film project was going to be uh, kind of this pet project of his that he'd been trying to get off the ground for years with other filmmakers like George Lucas. Uh, and that, of course, is uh, the classic uh, Vietnam War film Apocalypse Now, which is a loose adaptation of the controversial novel Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. So in this documentary, this to me is like the best kind of Hollywood behind the scenes documentary ever made because Apocalypse Now, if if you're not aware, is probably one of the most troubled film productions of all time. Um, so basically the documentary is we get this amazing behind the scenes footage from uh, Coppola's wife, Eleanor, who's just kind of she kind of jokes at the beginning of the documentary that I think, you know, Francis told her to just kind of film stuff as it happened. I think as more of a way to kind of keep her busy as they were filming this movie in the, in the Philippines. Um, little did Coppola know though, that the movie would actually end up having to take over two years to film. He'd have to mortgage his family's home just in order to finish this dream film project. Um, yeah, basically it goes through everything in this troubled production. Uh, we have uh, monsoons, or t sorry, typhoons coming through and destroying sets in the Philippines. We get Marlon Brando holding out for more money, basically showing up in no, you know, doesn't know his lines. We see like his lines written out on these giant cue cards on set. Um Martin Sheen has a heart attack and nearly dies like halfway through production. And had he passed away, um, they pro probably would have had to scrap the entire movie. And plus two, we also learned that Martin Sheen wasn't always the lead in the movie. They actually shot for a week with Harvey Keitel as the lead before they realized, you know what? This maybe isn't working out. So the film also kind of has interviews with Coppola and some of the, um, cast and people like George Lucas in the early 90s so we have we get this amazing behind the scenes footage and then it'll cut to you know Coppola in 91 talking about you know kind of what he was going through personally and how he was having you know at one point suicidal thoughts while while making this movie uh, probably my favorite part though is when we get to see uh, Dennis Hopper who plays this war photographer and he shows up and basically he admits like, you know what? I was just happy to get the job. I wasn't getting hired for every, for anything. He just had a serious drug problem. So he shows up on set. Of course he doesn't know his lines. And uh, so it shows him kind of all spaced out on set. And then it cuts to like present day Dennis Hopper. And he's just like, yeah, I was in, I was, you know, I shouldn't have been working. Like I was in no, I was in no state of mind to properly work on this movie. So it's just, it's fascinating as somebody who's like a total movie buff, like myself, like apocalypse now is one of my favorite movies. And then to have this documentary go through this wild ride of this, the most infamous movie production of all time is, is just incredible. So, um, yeah, if you've not had a chance to check out Hearts of Darkness, a filmmaker's apocalypse, please go check it out. We have it on DVD. You cannot stream this one through Hoopla <laughs> or Canopy. Borrow the DVD from us. Uh, you will not be disappointed. It's just a fascinating picture of one of the most um, critically acclaimed movies of all time. And that's the other thing, too. Like, a lot of people there would be these reports out of Hollywood at the time about this troubled production. And this is going to be an absolute disaster. But meanwhile, um, it's up there with the Godfather and the Godfather two is, you know, mentioned as one of these greatest movies of all time. And it ended up winning a lot of awards and it made a ton of money. So, um, but yeah, it's just really a fascinating story. Well, I will definitely need to check this one out. Yeah, and especially, too, with a lot of these documentaries, um, you know, if we're doing a top five films list, you know, a lot of films are 
very easily accessible on stuff like Netflix or Crave or whatever. Um, a lot of these documentaries are documentaries in general are just harder to find. So, you know, if there's a topic that you like, ask a librarian like, Hey, I'm interested in a documentary about this. And I'm sure we've got something that you can uh, stream or, or borrow on DVD or Blu-ray. So uh, yeah, that's what the library is there for. Yeah, we also have our personal picks lists. So you can, uh, on the website, um, under uh, services, you can request a, a list based on what you enjoy. So if you've maybe seen uh, Hearts of Darkness and uh, want to watch other documentaries that are similar to that, uh, tell us what you've enjoyed, what you're looking for, and uh, a staff member will put put together a list of titles that you might want to check out. So we'll go into our roundtable questions. Uh, first question, what is something that you would like to see a documentary about, Bryce? All right, I'm going a little inside EPL on this one. I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but I remember hearing this story that, okay, in 2007... The White Stripes were here in Edmonton for a concert at the Shaw Conference Center. Now, during that tour, the White Stripes would do these free pop-up shows in each city. Now, according to Edmonton lore, the White Stripes were actually supposed to play a free concert at the Stanley A. Milner Library in our theater. For whatever reason, that concert did not take place instead they played at a youth rec center so i mean that's still cool they played this free concert at the rec center but what happened what happened to epl so i'd love to know i'm sure there's like and i have searched <laughs> online there are memos and stuff but i would would love to see a documentary talking heads about why we didn't have the white stripes play at the Stanley E. Milner library downtown. I see now what this whole episode has been an excuse for you to turn this into an investigative journal journalism podcast. Yes, that is my dream. Uh, yeah, I, we need to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. Maybe it was it could be something as simple as like this is going to be huge. Maybe we don't have enough staff booked that day. It was all very last minute. I think like I can't imagine getting a phone call being like, "Hey Bryce, uh, the White Stripes are going to be at the Milner Library on Saturday. Um, let's do something." Like there'd be a lot of work behind the scenes. But I would I'd love to get the inside scoop on why it didn't happen. Maybe it was, or maybe it was something as simple as. The theater was booked that day for somebody else to use. So who knows? Yeah. Caroline, what would you love to see documentary on? So I had to think because, I, like I said at the beginning, I will watch a documentary about just about anything. Um, and my first thought was uh, I always kind of want – I think people could do more in the world of ballroom dancing. Uh, but then I thought it probably exists already and I just haven't come across it out there. So then I remembered what I have thought would be a fun documentary. I don't know, Bryce, are you, how familiar are you with a TV show called Saved by the Bell? Quite familiar. Okay. Quite familiar. Then yes. you may remember that um, Saved by the Bell used a lot of the same background extras in the series, which made sense because the show was set at a California high school. And so mm -hmm. the other students, it made sense that, you know, it wasn't this random revolving thing. I think it would be very interesting to have a documentary about the background extras on Saved by the Bell. 
I want to know <laughs> what their experience was. I want to know what they thought about the characters they were playing. I want to know if they were jealous of like the ones who over time got like speaking roles. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, what were they, w- were they trying to be actors? Was this just um, a job for them? Were they hooking up with each other or anyone in the main cast? I think there are stories there because, you know, there's this group that is visible, but we know nothing about them. They're not even credited in most of the episodes, Um, but you could recognize them on site most of the time because they were so visible. So I don't know. I, I just think there's something there around Saved by the Bell extras. I would watch that immediately. I would pay like if there was like a Kickstarter I'd pay money into that to get the behind the scenes scoop of extras from Saved by the Bell. Like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Like if one of them, you know, you're just average student walking in the background with a binder one scene, but maybe the next episode you're told that, Hey, uh, Screech needs some kind of uh, nerds, if you will, for this one scene. Yeah. Grab those suspenders. You're you're suiting up. You're going to be a, a nerd or something like that. Like, do you get pumped up because you know you're going to get some extra screen time or something? So, exactly, lots of stories to be told there. Screech is doing something. The next episode, it's a date auction, and so you're going to be the nerd that no one bids on. Like, this yeah. is, but you're still not going to have any lines for this. Like, it's uh, like, are you are you excited? Are you nervous? Are you like, this is my big break? Like. What are you, what have you do, done since like all of this? I think it's good that and there's, so there's two things I've thought perhaps a little bit too much about this. That one I think really <laughs> lends itself to the documentary format. The other extras or background actors that um, I think a lot about are the dancers from Dirty Dancing the original oh, yeah. movie um, because you see them in a number of scenes. Obviously they're usually dancing um, or hanging out together. They're in the big finale. Um, that one I think lends itself more to like um, an article ranking of the, the background actors of dirty dancing. Um, not to say that I don't think they could carry a documentary. I just really see that for the longevity of Saved by the Bell, which lasted, you know, five seasons, if you include the Tory year. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's the one I, I, I thought if I were going to be a document, I were going to be a documentarian. <laughs> that's, that's what I would, would do. I would watch that Caroline. I would uh, back your, kickstarter for sure oh that's that's very nice of you (laughs) um okay so our next question uh what should we do for our next top five all right so i think you've maybe had this idea before in our um march madness one but favorite spinoffs like a good spinoff story so you know whether it be better call saul or um different strokes or whatever frazier I think we could have some fun with that one. Top five detectives, uh, including, you know, maybe official um, police or FBI or actual people who have actual authority. And then, you know, you've got your unofficial people who can't help keeping their nose out of whatever mystery is going on. I like that. Yeah, Yeah, that could be a good one. So we'll see. Who knows? Maybe in a few months we'll do one of these episodes again. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Make sure that you're subscribed uh, so that you get all of our new episodes. Please also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can tell us uh, about your own top five documentaries. Um, More importantly, if you liked what you heard, tell a friend about the show. Don't forget that we'll have a link to everything that we talked about in today's show notes. We talked about a lot of documentaries, so make sure you click on the show notes and uh, go through and uh, see all the great films that we've discussed. And of course, we'd love to hear from our listeners. You can reach us on Twitter at EPL.ca and use the hashtag 
EPL overdue fines or email us at podcast at epl.ca. Both Caroline and myself get those emails. So uh, let us uh, know about your thoughts about our picks or uh, share with us uh, some of your favorite documentaries. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.